Tom here from Lawrence Systems, and we're going to dive into Captive Portal on PFSense and some common use cases for it. Before we dive into the details of this video, if you'd like to learn more about me and my company, head over to lawrencesystems.com. If you'd like to hire a short project today, hire us button right at the top. If you'd like to support this channel in other ways, there's some affiliate links down below to get you deals and discounts on products and services we talk about on this channel. Now let's dive into Captive Portal, and we're going to start with some prerequisites to get this working properly and at its optimal settings. And the first thing I want to talk about is the Captive Portal documentation over at NetGate. It's great. They have a lot of things that's covered in here. They have more than we possibly have time to cover in this video. So I will reference this as, hey, if you want to know more, there is a lot you can dive into about some you know specific things. Does not yet support IPv6. That's important for those of you that always ask me about IPv IPv6. So yeah, that's a issue still in case you're wondering. We're also going to mention authenticating OpenVPN users with free radius. I know we're not authenticating VPN users, but if you take out VPN users, you can just say authenticating users with free radius. This document will help you get free radius set up. It's not required that you do this, but I'm going to show the advanced use case where you can set up per user bandwidth restrictions and free radius is the way to do that. You can set up bandwidth restrictions without free radius, but they start applying to everyone as opposed to setting them up on an individual basis. So we're going to cover both of those scenarios, but I'm going to leave a reference to this document. And then we're going to cover, and we'll probably just start right here, what this LAN is. We have two of them. This is the general wide open where I want all my devices LAN that are not, you know, part of the guest network. And this is the guest network LAN 2 for purposes of this particular video. The guest network, please note, is not too restricted. One, we have changed the web configuration, and the web configuration lives at 5555. And that's important that it's not at your standard port 443. This can interfere with redirection and some of the problems you may run into with Captive Portal. So these are also, I'm telling you this because these are some of the things people overlook when they're having trouble with Captive Portal. So if you follow this exactly, hopefully you'll have no problems at all setting up your Captive Portal. Next is I have this because the guest network blocking access to the web interface on here. So no problem. We're on a different network. We're actually connecting this from externally. So I'm allowed to access it, but devices on the guest network will not be able to. And devices on the guest network have been denied access to things on the LAN side. Now, something that's important, please note DNS is not blocked. Having proper DNS is going to be an important prerequisite for this as well. So our LAN is 192.168.40.1 and LAN 2, our guest network is 192.168.1.1. Next, we have to make sure that we have a domain name for our captive portal. Now, this is something, as I said, working optimally. Can you do it without it? Yeah, you can have it forward with a non-HTTPS and that will work but some browsers such as Google Chrome and some phones may have problems. And as more things start to default to HTTPS, they will also start breaking your captive portal because if you don't have a fully qualified domain name and an SSL certificate on there, it will just not forward and kind of get stuck in a loop. I noticed that problem with the latest version of Chrome. It just kind of stops because it's trying to you know, redirect via HTTPS. Now, We'll cover setting it up. I will mention though, right now we're running 2.52 RC PFSense Community Edition, but whether you're using the Community Edition or the PFSense Plus here in June of 2021, it's gonna look the same on either one. There's no difference in Captive Portal between the two versions. And honestly, even between older versions of PFSense, Captive Portal hasn't changed dramatically. It's only gotten a few more features. Now let's talk about the domain name part. We go here, service. And I have Acme Cert loaded. This is my automatic certificate management engine loaded and grabbing a Let's Encrypt Cert for DetroitYodelingCompany.com. I've covered this before in another video, I'll leave a link below, but basically you want a wildcard certificate. So this system, and I'm using the DNS registration method so you can have wildcard certs. This allows you to have that cert so we can create subdomains such as portal.detroititalincompany.com to allow the captive portal to have a fully qualified domain name. And this solves all those HTTPS problems that you may run into with it. Speaking of which, that's why I said DNS has to work. So if we go here to DNS Resolver, we're going to scroll down and we'll see that I've created portal.detroityodelingcompany.com and I've given it the internal 
LAN2 guest IP address. That's important. If I would have gave it the LAN IP address for the captive portal, that would have been a problem because we've told the guest network you can't talk to the LAN. You can only talk to LAN2. So by saying portal.detroityodlingcompany.com, I should have probably picked a shorter domain, uh, is 192.168.11, and that is the LAN2. So this is what the settings look like for that. Now, we have a Windows machine that we're going to be using for Captive Portal. It's at 192.168.1.118. It's behind that LAN2 section of the PFSense. And right here is the default gateway, which, of course, is the PFSense. And when we try to ping portal.detroityodlingcompany.com, we do indeed get... DetroitYodelingCompany.com at 192.168.11. So everything matches the request, the response. These are some of those prerequisites that are really important that they work prior to you even turning on the captive portal. Now, captive portal will allow DNS queries to go from machines behind it talking to PFSense, but it won't let them go past the PFSense. That's where Captive Portal blocks any type of transactions to go to different websites. You may resolve those websites. It will do DNS answers to it, but it will not let them go past and actually route traffic. Uh, this is one of those reasons I mentioned that it's a guest network, but when you're looking at the firewall rules, it's once again, very important that you do not have DNS blocked and that the DHCP server hands out the PFSense for DNS. If it's not handing out DNS, then you'll have to, whatever DNS server you're using, you'll have to make sure you have entries for wherever the location is for your portal. Uh, to me, it's easier just to have on the guest network, have PFSense both do the DNS resolution and have that extra entry to where the portal is. The other thing I'm not going to cover, but I recommend you read if this is a use case you have. It's kind of neat that they've built this in. I've not really done a lot with it, but if you have the use case for vouchers and to pre-build series of vouchers to allow users access, that's completely an option they have in there um, where it can generate essentially tokens which allow a user a certain limited, based on the parameters you build for each voucher, uh, use of access. So let's say coffee house example is you want to say with a cup of coffee, here's your voucher. We're going to tape it to the side of the cup. And that would give you X amount of internet based on that voucher's parameters that expires based on, once again, the voucher's parameters. So it's kind of cool that this is all built in, but we're not going to be covering it today. If there's enough questions about it, maybe I'll cover it in a future video, but it's not something we see as often. And it's relatively easy to set up once you have Captive Portal working. Now let's get over and start setting up Captive Portal and services. Let me go here to Captive Portal. And I have this one set up. We're going to add a new one to just cover the basic part. To, for people that just want to get it done, we'll set this demo up right here. Save and continue. Enable Captive Portal. And as I said, LAN 2. Let's walk through the settings basically. Max concurrent connections, kind of self-explanatory. Idle, hard timeouts, traffic quotas, pass-through MAC address, per pass-through credits per MAC address. This is where you start getting to some of... The allow passing it through Captive Portal with authentication limited number of times a MAC address. Once used up, that client can only log in with valid credentials until a waiting period is specified. This is where you can really start, you know, beating up on your guests a little bit. Make sure they stay within certain parameters on there. Reset waiting period. Log out pop-out window. Don't guarantee that works. Pop-out windows sometimes don't pop up anymore in browsers, so that may or may not work. Pre-authentication. After authentication, where do you want to send them afterwards? Blocked MAC address URL, so blocked MAC addresses will go here. So if you uh, found some users abusing it, you can drop some MAC addresses in there. Preserve connected users across reboot. This is a reboot of PFSense, not their reboot. And this is uh, important to a couple of our clients that have a large number of people using the captive portal system because when they've applied an update to PFSense, they don't want to have to re-authenticate, oh, I don't know, about 2,000 people against it. Yes, they have that many on there. Mac filtering, pass through Mac per bandwidth restrictions. This is kind of neat because this is going to allow us to say per bandwidth and we can say restrict the bandwidth on there. And this is something really popular for guest users because, well, we don't want to give them full speed. We want to give them some limited amount of speed per user logged in. Now, you can use a custom uploaded logo. You can also use custom captive portal page. We're going to skip all that and leave everything default. We'll leave this default here. We don't even care about authentication. We really just want them to click the box to agree to this. You know, uh, agree to some terms and conditions that no one will read. That's all we're going to do. And we're going to skip for now this part. This is just getting Captive Portal set up in the most basic of ways right here. So now we can go back over to our Windows 10 lab. 
we'll try to ping something like google.com. It resolves because we're allowing DNS and that's it. It's not actually gonna allow any traffic routing until we open up a browser and get the captive portal. So let's go ahead and try and open up something and try to go to a site. It's gonna sit and think because it tries HTTPS. Let's uh, try this, come on. Eventually it'll fail and redirect, but these are some of the first problems you run into if you don't have. I think if we put HTTP, HTTP in front of this. There we go. Took a second of trying and then it goes, oh, I guess you wanted to try HTTP because new Chrome tries HTTPS first. And I agree to the terms and conditions. We can click on the terms and conditions. Agree to some TNC that no one will read. Log in. It's going to sit and think, but while it's thinking, we can refresh the page. Google works. CNET's opening. Things are working again here because we've authenticated the user. Now, We've done this and we can go see authenticated users over here. So we'll click on the little icon here. We're gonna look at the demo one we just set up. Hey, there's that user. It says unauthenticated, tells me how many bytes received, session duration. We can trash that user and force them to disconnect or we can disconnect all users, show last activity of this particular user. And uh, let's do something real quick here. Let's actually do a bandwidth test. So here is the internal speed test server, and we're going to watch a reasonably fast speed test happen here. All right, we got plenty of speed, plenty of bandwidth on it, and you know we don't necessarily want our guests having all this. So how do you start narrowing down and doing those restrictions so the, the guests can't suck up all the bandwidth on the line? We're going to go here to services, capture portal, play with our demo one. Then we'll go down here. And we're going to restrict them to uh, 200. Pretty simple. Per user bandwidth restriction, default download, default upload. Scroll down here, hit save. Then we're going to go back over here. Actually, before I forget, i got to get rid of that user. So go to demo. So it's got to go through the reload the page. I agree. Because that was an HTTP speed test page, it redirected fast. It didn't pause like it did waiting for HTTPS. But it does pause on the redirect here. It's all right. Now let's see what the bandwidth looks like. All right. And we get the 0.2 megabits. That that's it. That's all we're allowed to have here. Obviously, you can tune this however you want. And now this is done on a per user. So each person that clicks the authentication page, each device, I should say, is going to click it and then be restricted to that amount of bandwidth that you have set inside of there. So, you know, you divvy up the bandwidth and you're allowed then to set up all the users. Now, granted, all the users get the same bandwidth and maybe that's as far as you need to go. And you don't have to watch the end of this video because this is all you really need to get that basic level of captive portal configured and set up. But what if you wanted to go more advanced? What if you want to set up speed settings on a per user basis? So let's go ahead and disconnect all these users. Okay, that user's gone. Services, captive portal. And instead of doing any further, we're just going to trash that one. And let's go to the more advanced one we have. I'm just got to move it over to LAN 2 here. So this is the Detroit Yodeling Company one with that domain. And all these options are still there, but we're going to be using the free radius server to give us more control over this. Now, when we scroll down here, Use a custom upload logo. We checked that. I didn't bother creating a custom portal. The authentication, I think, is fine the way it works, but that is an option, of course. Then we have the use custom background image. Same thing, some terms and condition, no one will read, but we'll still click on. And use authenticated backend. And this is where we get the totally rad auth server and the radius server. The next thing we do is scroll down and save yourself some headache. If you're wanting to get this per bandwidth user restriction set up, make sure this is checked down here. If you're using traffic quotas, as in you'll limit to exactly how much bandwidth a user can pull, you can do that. But for the most part, you're usually just restricting them so they don't have free reign to use too much bandwidth. So we check this box that says use radius, PF sense bandwidth max up and PS bandwidth max down attributes. Yep, everything else is, uh, the default and enable HTTPS login. This is the important part. And this is that DNS entry we made, portal.detroityodelingcompany.com. And what certificate are we going to use? We're going to use that Detroit Yodeling Company certificate that's part of the Acme wildcard that we have on there. And then we can click save. 
Now let's go over and look at free radius under services. So we go to services, free radius, and we have two users. We have Speedy and Slothmore. So we'll log into Slothmore first, and we've got a password set. I just set the password to be test. We have a redirect page of go to the speed page right afterwards, so we can do it redirect, no problem there. We could set down here is where the bandwidth, and we've got this max bandwidth of 2,000 kilobits and 2,000 kilobits for up and down. Obviously, set them whatever works for you, and you do have the ability to do the upload, download traffic in megabytes, but like I said, I, I'm less people I see doing that, and then you set the time period for when it does when it resets like they get this much traffic per day or per week or per month or forever like that's it you'll never get any more bandwidth once you've consumed this much but like i said this is the one we're going to focus on here then we're going to click save now let's go ahead and go to google.com or any other https page and you notice it has no problem redirecting to a fully certificate valid captive portal it works way faster even Google is smart enough to go, hey, you need to connect to this network and realizes that this wasn't secure and redirects you there immediately, even though it was HTTPS. So we can then use Slothmore, test, don't read those terms and conditions, just agree to them and hit log in. It redirected this page. And we'll do the test and we can see that Slothmore is pretty restricted on bandwidth. Actually, we don't even need to finish the test. We already know what happens. And we know how that story plays out. Google even automatically redirected and finished redirecting to the HTTPS. Not a problem. Let's go ahead and first let's edit Slothmore. So he goes to another HTTPS site like lawrencesystems.com. Copy and paste as your friend. So we'll scroll down here. Save. And then we're going to go to services, captive portal. Just disconnect that particular user. Actually, we'll go to uh, news.com. Make sure it's doing HTTPS. And where does it go? Oh, not secure. Didn't work the way I wanted it to, so we'll try hitting Google again. These are sometimes errors you run into with Captive Portal. Let's just close the browsers. It probably thinks it's still authenticated. It pulled the cache version, and after I refreshed the page, it did the Captive Portal and re redirected properly. This is something I'm happy that it did this. These are some of the problems you run into uh, when a user gets dropped, but the session cache is still there, like inside of the browser. It may keep thinking it's connected because the DNS resolves, but it doesn't actually route the data, so it tries to pull local cache copies. FYI, that's one of those challenges you may run into with Captive Portal. So let's go back over to Slothmore. Test. I agree. And you can see it did an HTTPS redirect to lawrencesystems.com. No problem at all. No error message involved because it's all HTTPS from one HTTPS site to another one. So that worked perfectly fine. We're going to close the browser before we uh, get rid of the user and show you the other user. So let me refresh this page. Fill off this user. Then we're going to go to services, free radius, and we're going to look at speedy. And Speedy, we have redirecting to this page here. We can really direct and relate to any page we want, but I want that page because you notice I have no bandwidth restrictions on this one. So the user Speedy shouldn't have a problem at all. And hey, for good measure, let's open up Microsoft Edge. And try to go to bing.com because I think that's where they want us to go. And Edge works no problem. Speedy, test. Agreed to something that we're not going to read. And we can see that Speedy has no problems. So it's going to get the full bandwidth on there because we didn't put any restrictions on there. Now, the next question that comes up, what if I want to restrict them afterwards? So we'll put in 400, 400 for user Speedy. Hit save. And try it now. And let's see what happens. Still getting full bandwidth. It's important because... That restriction, even though I saved it here, isn't applied until that user gets disconnected. So we're going to go ahead and go to Captive Portal. Go here. Drop this user. We'll close the browser so we don't have any in there. We can go back to Chrome. 
and do this. And by the way, once you authenticate, actually, we're supposed to go to Bing.com, I think. Yeah. Once you authenticate on one, it'll authenticate in both. So if we authenticate here, I put the password right. I did now. There we go. As I refresh the page, it stopped the redirect. But now we can see that this user has been restricted to the 0.4 megabits. Now, if we open up Google Chrome right now, which will actually go pretty slow, let's go to Google. Actually, I should probably close this. It's actually so bandwidth restricted, this is painful. <laughs> We're so used to fast internet now, so let's go to Google. There we go. With all of its speed, it's still working. So let's go ahead and go to the speed test now. And you're going to get the same speed test in Google because it's restricting it based on its MAC address and IP information and not going to allow this to have any more bandwidth. So it doesn't matter what applications they open. It's not authenticating the browser. The browser is being used to pass the authentication information over to PFSense. Which we'll go ahead and refresh this page again. And there is that particular user telling me how much data that user has sent. Now, the last thing I wanted to cover is the automated MAC address authentication. So we can just hit copy right here. And this is where you can do some pretty simple things in the captive portal. And let's go ahead and see captive portal. We're going to add pass to this MAC address right here. Allow this Windows machine. And we'll say 800 kilobits. Why not? That seems like a good bandwidth on there. Hit save. That means this one will automatically pass. So let's go here. Close that. Go to captive portal. Go here. Disconnect the user, which means it shouldn't be authenticated. But open it back up. And it's working. As a matter of fact, let's go to the Libre speed now. And this particular user is restricted just like it was. And it doesn't matter if the IP address changes. One thing of note, when we refresh this right here, nothing. There is, when you're doing it this way, it doesn't show anyone authenticated because you've done in that particular captive portal, it doesn't show the username session. So if we go services, captive portal, for each allowed MAC address, it just works. You don't have to matter. It doesn't matter what IP address it gets. It doesn't matter um, anything else. It just says, all right, if this MAC address is assigned to a device, obviously this opens you up to the potential for MAC spoofing. If you were really worried about restricting on there, if someone imitates the same MAC address, they're going to be able to make that happen. But then you'll end up with a collision on a network if that device is, and you'll create other confusion. So there are, of course, ways around it. Uh, it's something, though, that is handy to use. And we actually kind of end up using it frequently when people say, hey, I have a guest network. I really want to capture portal and do the bandwidth restrictions. But I want to do them in a way that uh, allows these IoT devices to be limited in bandwidth. It's actually also a really simple way to set up captive portal and use it just to authenticate all your devices implicitly and set a bandwidth restriction on each of them. It's just a simple way to make that work. And uh, yeah, I, it's something we've definitely used a few times because it's it's quick and easy way to uh, get that functionality in the system. All right, the next question I wanted to make sure I cover is that yes, it does work on a phone. So Studio 100 is the device setup that we have connected to this PFSense with that captive portal. So what we're gonna do is go ahead and Connect to Studio 100. And the first thing it does is redirect me on my phone here to this. Speedy, and we'll put the password in. Agree. Log in. And just like normal, it redirects us to that page. Matter of fact, let's go back over there. And all the same rules applies. We can do this speed test right here. We can see we still have speedy restricted to this particular amount of bandwidth. And as long as you have concurrent logins, it will allow more than one login from the same user, even if they're on different devices. That kind of depends down to that configuration of whether or not you want to allow that feature. 
So hopefully that helps you get started with Captive Portal. The last thing, like I said, if there's enough interest, the voucher system I think is pretty neat, but I think it would be its own video and kind of be a part two to this one. I don't want to get too deep into it. I've not used it too often, but when I have set it up, it is kind of neat to be able to create all the individual tickets and even download them into a spreadsheet and kind of that the use case of any coffee house that I mentioned earlier. So if there's enough interest in a voucher video, maybe I'll take the time to make it. Leave the comments below and let me know. If not, uh, go ahead and you know, comment on this video. Let me know what I may have missed, what else I need clarification on, or have a more in-depth discussion over at our forums. All right, and thanks. And thank you for making it to the end of this video. If you enjoyed this content, please give it a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more content from this channel, hit the subscribe button and the bell icon. To hire a sure project, head over to lawrencesystems.com and click on the Hire Us button right at the top. To help this channel out in other ways, there is a Join button here for YouTube and a Patreon page where your support is greatly appreciated. For deals, discounts, and offers, check out our affiliate links in the descriptions of all of our videos, including a link to our shirt store where we have a wide variety of shirts and new designs come out, well, randomly, so check back frequently. And finally, our forums. Forums.lawrencesystems.com is where you can have a more in-depth discussion about this video and other tech topics covered on this channel. Thank you again, and we look forward to hearing from you. In the meantime, check out some of our other videos.